Hello and welcome to the three-time award-winning Tough Girl podcast, which is all about motivating and inspiring you while increasing the amount of female role models in the media. I'm your host, Sarah Williams. If you love adventure, challenge and hearing from women who share their stories and provide top tips and advice to help you take on your own personal challenges, make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out. New episodes go live every Tuesday at 7am UK time with occasional bonus episodes going live on a Thursday. You can support the Tough Girl mission by signing up as a patron by visiting patreon, p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Tough Girl podcast. Keep listening until the very end as I share more information about what's going on with me with Tough Girl challenges, give shout outs to members of the tribe and recommend other Tough Girl podcast episodes. Plus find out about future guests. More information is available at toughgirlchallenges.com. My name is Sasha DeJulian. I'm a professional rock climber. I am based in Boulder, Colorado, and I guess that's me in a nutshell. Did you grow up in um, Boulder, Colorado? Uh, no, I grew up in the Washington, D.C. area in Old Town, Alexandria, Virginia, and I lived in New York City for a while, and now I'm based in Boulder. So since graduating from college and spending some time in Europe, I came back to what I like to call the Mecca of American outdoor living is Boulder. What were your early years like? I mean, what were you like as a little girl? Were you quite sporty, outdoorsy? I mean, did your parents or family take you climbing? Is that when it all sort of clicked for you? I was really sporty growing up. I dabbled in a bunch of different sports, been skiing since I was three. I was in figure skating, soccer, tennis, swim team, all in my early developmental years. And then when I was six, also, my brother had a birthday party at a climbing gym. And that's actually how I discovered climbing. I didn't have anyone in my family that even knew that climbing was a sport and neither did I. When I was six, it was just kind of like this hobby-esque thing that my brother had a birthday party with all of his school friends and hockey buddies. He was a year older than me. I was insanely competitive with him too. His name's Charlie. I don't think that he reciprocated the competitiveness, but I was the feisty younger sister. And climbing was just like this thing that clicked for me. I happened to be better than my brother at it. And I started going to the gym like about twice a week for what was called a junior team practice. I joined the the local climbing gyms club, which was a way to get kids from the tri-state area together and, and climb with instructors. Then one Saturday morning, when the gym was having a competition, I walked in with my mom for Saturday morning practice. And we kind of literally stumbled upon climbing as a competitive sport. And uh, the organizers let me compete. It was a regional championship. I competed in the 11 and under category and kind of magically won my category. I didn't really know any sort of aspirations that I had in the sport prior to that, except that I loved it. And it was what I wanted to do. And as I got more involved with climbing, other sports kind of started to drop by the wayside, except for, you know, skiing. I still ski quite a bit, but yeah, I've always really loved sports and I've always really loved to be outdoors, but growing up in the Washington DC area, there weren't too many like outdoor outlets at least comparatively to Boulder, Colorado. So a lot of my early years in climbing were in the climbing gym. When did you realize that you were gifted or talented or, you know, was it, did some, did you have a mentor from a young age or somebody who sort of said, hold on, she has got real skill here and actually we can really develop this? Yeah, I definitely had really foundational people in my life like my mom, from the perspective of her just bringing me everywhere to drive me to climbing practice and to competitions up and down the East Coast. And eventually when I was 12, going to Europe and internationally, but also my first coach that I had, who I actually started training with right after this competition, he kind of scouted me at the regionals, was named 
Claudia Vidulescu, and he was a Romanian uh, immigrant to the U.S. He had he had just moved, and he was developing this elite climbing youth program. I trained with him for many years, and he really instilled in me like this discipline and and that good is never good enough. And it was a really strict kind of Eastern European approach to training. And through that, I always just wanted to be perfect and to impress him and to succeed on the team. I was the youngest of this like little elite club. Also on it were two friends that I got close with Andrea and Gabor and their mom was a Hungarian Olympic gymnast. And I would say that in my early years, she was a major mentor to not only myself, but also to my mom. Her name was Eva. She told my mom, Sasha has a talent and you should learn how to belay so you can support her because then she can go to school and you can belay her at climbing practice and make it more efficient. So it's actually kind of funny. My mom learned how to belay when I was seven and that's essentially standing on the bottom and holding the rope because when you're free climbing, like you're climbing with a rope and you're establishing different check marks on, on the wall as you clip your rope into what's either, you know, bolts into the climbing wall. So my mom learned to hold the rope and catch me when I fell from when I was seven, she would belay me every single practice. And then we started climbing outside and it was kind of this little community that I had in the DC area. I also always grew up with idols that included Lynn Hill, who I had a poster of her on my wall that said it goes boys when she did the first ascent of the first free ascent of the nose on El Capitan. And since then we've become friends here in Boulder and we're actually neighbors. So I really cherish like the people who played foundational roles in my early life. I'm still quite close with the friends that I had and, and the people that were involved because it was such a special connection. I mean, two things that you said that was almost that sentence, you know, good is never good enough. And perfect or perfection or wanting to be perfect and at such a young age you know how did you deal with that pressure like because I was, I actually feel like almost quite sad like good is never good enough and I'm actually just like oh like, <laughs> how did that affect you mentally yeah no it is interesting because I think that I I'm 29 about to turn 30 and and I hate to say like generational difference of like today's day and age But I think that there was a little bit. I grew up when my first national youth national championship that I won, I was 12. I remember being so happy and running over to my coach. He started telling me what I had done wrong on the climb. And I had completed the climb. That's in climbing competitions. Like who gets the highest in the discipline of sport climbing is the winner. And so I had been the only one in my age category, which was year 92, 91. I'm a 92 to complete the climb. And and I remember him picking apart all of my mistakes. And I actually really thrived in that. It was sometimes hard for me because it would be like, I just want to be so happy and my mom's happy. Like I achieved what I've been training for, but his mentality, which I've carried throughout is train so hard that even on a bad day, you can still succeed. I know that I've definitely dealt with a lot of pressure and I've gone through my own battles of ups and downs with that. And also the kind of external pressure that you feel as a professional athlete and then the intrinsic pressure, I'm really hard on myself. And I think that that's some of the self-work that today I do work on, but my perspective on the pressure that you deal with as a professional athlete, it's just always been there and something that I have to deal with and learn to use to my advantage. And I think that sometimes it can be crippling, but then sometimes it can be quite motivating. So I think it's just a balance and it all starts within and how you can manage that and 
how then I can take it and perform on the rock. Because the reality is that when you're actually climbing and now what I do is free climbing outdoors, I don't compete anymore. Um, so I do these like big adventures. There is no one that really like the rock isn't going to tell you, I'm sorry that you feel so much pressure. Let me go easy on you. Like nothing's going to bend to your feelings in the outdoor elements. You just have to be uh, in the right intrinsic mental space. When you started sort of getting success at such a young age, did you know that you wanted to make this a career? Did you even think that this was a possibility that you could become a professional climber and climb for a living? Absolutely not. <laughs> I actually, you know, climbing's come a long way in the early, early days, like when I was, you know, in my six to 10, 12 early adolescence, climbing was always just this thing that when I started competing, like I had the drive to want to win because I was a kid and, and that's, it's fun to succeed. But I didn't really look at it. It wasn't a sport like tennis where you see these superstars on TV and and they're making these like big contracts and everything. Climbing has always and still is a niche sport, though it's grown exponentially over the last decade in particular. I remember, though, at 12, I got approached. I just won my first international competition, the Pan American Championships in Mexico City. I got approached by a climbing shoe company called Mad Rock. They wanted to sponsor me and sponsorship meant like some free product and some competition podium incentives. And I remember being very adamant that my parents had nothing to do with my career. And throughout the rest of my career, that maintained the case. Like I never once let them see a single contract or anything like that. I was always like, let me handle it. In a way, it was pretty tied to me wanting my my parents to understand climbing as a legitimate sport. I should say my family in general, and that it could be a profession. So I think slowly over my like early teen years, I started getting approached more and more through sponsorship. And it was, again, nothing to write home about. Like I wasn't making my own living. But then when I was about 16, 17, I started to. I think that it's been like this gradual learning process where I've actually learned quite a bit about building your own brand through the process because that's what's required in climbing your entire salary and income is tied to you personally and, and what you're doing within the sport, but also for your sponsors. And, and there's a big marketing component. It's been an interesting journey. I mean, I've been a part of it since I was very young. I never really was like, I want to be a professional climber and that's going to be my career. I, I think I always comprehended it as like, I want to be a professional climber. And then I also want to be X, Y, Z profession. Like it kind of changed through the years. It's just been me following this sport that I really love and, and dominoes have kind of fallen into place, sometimes not in place as I've grown up with it. I've been climbing for 24 years now. Did you have a plan B? You you went to college. Was that your your plan B, or was that something that you discussed with your your family? Sort of, they wanted you to get an education, or did you want to? Did you want to get an education, or did you just want to go and go and climb? Yeah, I didn't really think of it as a plan B. I never grew up though thinking I wouldn't go to college. That was just the household rule that I grew up kind of installed into me. Like my parents were always academics first, yet if you get good grades, you can miss school as long as you're managing your time and getting your schoolwork done. You know, you can fly to France and go to that competition over the weekend. I have always been quite adamant about being independent since I've been able to be from the financial side, because as I started developing more of a career for myself, it only made sense that I would put myself through college and all of the extra things that come with being a someone who has a career. But I never really thought, you know, if this climbing thing works out, this is what I'm going to do. It's always just been on my mind that I'm going to apply myself 
as much as I can to follow what I feel passionate about. And that was, that included going to Columbia University. I actually knew I wanted to go there from like sophomore year in high school because my trainer, Vadim Vinegar, was at Chelsea Piers. And I loved going to the city over weekends. I'd normally go up and train over the weekends from high school because it was about two and a half hour Amtrak ride, or I'd drive with my mom as ridiculous as it sounds. We'd go up on like a Saturday morning or Friday night and spend the weekend in New York city training. And that was from when I was about like 12 until I was about 16 that we were doing that. So I think that education is just so important during the time that I was in school it was a really hard balancing act to be quite honest. Like when I was in university, I was traveling Thursdays through Mondays, anywhere from Europe to Asia, just really trying to make a living so that I could continue to put myself through college. And as a result, there were some ups and downs with my own personal climbing performance that I had to be patient with because training hours were sacrificed when I had, you know, midterms or or some big paper. And it was quite stressful. And I think that this kind of lesson in time management, but I'm so glad that I did get an education because I think that I learned a lot of valuable life skills through just the process of being on campus and being an athlete that also had to find this balance. You made the transition from being sort of like a professional climber to free climbing outdoors. Why did you make that transition? So when I was 18 was when I won the combined female overall world championship title. And at that point, I had won our U.S. nationals a few times, Pan American championships a few times. And I started feeling way more enchanted by my experiences from climbing outside that I just felt this wave of, of motivation to find out what I was capable of on rock and competition exists on plastic. And it's a very artificial form of climbing because there's a root setter involved and the root setter basically designs the path of the on the wall that the competitors take. And that's what you're competing on versus on rock. There's a really natural, um, synergetic, almost experience that you have with nature. And I started climbing outside more and more kind of between competitions and during the off time from the actual like competition schedule that I had I felt more motivated and inclined to climb outside than I did indoors. And so it was just kind of this natural progression of following where I was more passionate about in the sport. And so as my love for climbing outside grew, my love for competing and climbing inside kind of started to dwindle away. It's a pretty natural progression as well within our sport is that I see it as I I kind of grew my name in the competition world and and started becoming known and started getting sponsors and support to enable me to go and travel the world and and start really challenging myself on this bigger more vast terrain some climbers stick to solely competing and some climbers stick to solely outdoor climbing it can be tough to do both where I was going to be balancing competing and also doing these big wall expeditions. But in 2012, I went on my first big wall expedition when I was 19 in the Dolomites. And I just fell in love with this like all encompassing adventure. And I knew that that was a path that I wanted to go forward with and climbing and set these like big first female ascents and first ascents around the world that really allowed me to connect with the places that I was going and with my climbing partners that I was on these adventures with. Because you've done over 30 first female ascents and eight significant first ascents, which is just incredible. And obviously, very difficult question, because I'm sure they're all like challenging in their own ways. But when you look back at some of the, the first ascents that you've done, 
which ones really stands out in your in your memory for whatever reason because of the challenge or because of the joy or because of the, the technique you, which really sort of holds some good memories for you yeah that is a challenging question because all of the different expeditions have had their own lessons that i've really taken and incorporated as i move forward and try to improve but One of the most memorable was actually that first time that I was doing a big wall in the Dolomites when I was 19. And we were climbing this route called Bella Vista. It had been established by Alexander Huber, who's this really incredible climber from Germany and and quite the legend. And he had established this route called Bella Vista. And I went with my climbing partner who was a professional climber from Spain. And we kind of went into it. I was very naive. I mean, it was my first time doing a big wall and a lot of my experience and knowledge, like early blocks of knowledge came from just learning on the go from him, my climbing partner. I remember we got to a point on the wall where always when you're climbing, you have to be very vigilant over what the weather patterns are doing and seeing if a storm is rolling through because getting stuck on the wall in a storm can be quite dangerous. But as we were progressing up the wall, we were getting nearer and nearer to the top. A big storm that wasn't in the forecast rolled through and it started hailing. And so we we found shelter in this like, crevice in the wall. And we waited out for about two hours. As that happened, our daylight started diminishing and we had not set out from the ground with the plan of having to sleep on the wall in any way. It was like a day mission. We were going to climb up, try and do the ascent in a day and get to the top and then come back down. And with descents, there's normally a hiking path down from the mountain or a set of rappels that you find. So in the Dolomites, the descents can be just as tricky almost as the ascents. By the time we made it to the top, daylight had completely diminished. We were wet and cold and we were looking for the descent and couldn't find it, couldn't find it. I realized that I had cell phone service. And so I was, oh, I could contact Alex Huber and find out how he descended the mountain. And so... I'm calling this total legend of a mountaineer and climber, Alex. And and he picks up, he's got a German accent and he answers. And I'm asking him, you know, we're at the top of Trechime Oeste. How do you get down? And it's like below freezing at this point. My down jacket's super wet. We have no food, no water. And he says, oh, Sasha, you're going to have to sleep at the top tonight. And I was like, what? He proceeded to tell me about how the descent would be too dangerous to navigate through the dark. And so it was just like a total moment of suffering where we were so excited to have completed this climb that we set out on, but also my naivete kind of shown with not being very prepared for like that plan B that you... (laughs) you mentioned. And so we ended up just shivering together for the night. And I fell asleep at one point, we would wake up kind of intermittently and look, keep looking for kind of a place to go down. But everywhere we looked was like this perilous drop. I think that sometimes those moments that are really hard and challenging are just really memorable of what I've learned and, and realizing that I appreciated just being so uncomfortable. Sometimes when you come back from an expedition, even today, I got back from an expedition like a couple of weeks ago, and I feel this total appreciation for the simplicity and looking back at all of the fun times that happened that were maybe more like type two fun, but we shivered our night through and ended up making our descent like at 5 a.m. the next morning at first light. And we got down to this little refugio, which is like this hut in the Dolomites. It was two euros per like five minutes for a shower. I remember getting like three coins and just appreciating that hot shower so much and getting pizza and eating it and then falling asleep till like 3 p.m. in the afternoon. But that was a really memorable experience. It was my first wall that I did that was... A really significant achievement. 
I guess maybe it's like amnesia, but I was really thrilled to, to start going after more feats like it. And that sort of was the beginning of my next chapter in climbing. I love that. That's, <laughs> there's so many lessons from that experience. When I was thinking type two fun, I'm thinking in the middle of the night when it's cold and you're damp with no food, I'm thinking type three, type four, type five fun. But Yeah, totally. I mean, and it's just that mixture as well of obviously the, you know, the achievement from your from your first war, like, you know, absolutely incredible. But then the reality. But do you know what? You will have learned so much from that climb going forward to all your future expeditions. And you mentioned that you've just come back from uh, from an expedition sort of a couple of weeks ago with expeditions now. How does it work? Are you involved in the planning? Do you have a team around you? How long are you out there for? Are you sort of camping? Is it a bit of van life? You know, is it weeks? Is it days when you take on a new sort of uh, wall or new face? Yeah, that's a great question. Every expedition is a little different, but there is a lot of planning involved. So the way that this last expedition that I went to, which was this goal to climb the hardest big wall achieved by a female team in the world. And we actually were successful, which was really cool. I had the idea of it about a year ago. It was because two famous professional climbers in our sport from Spain had established this line. And I read about it and I thought that it sounded like a really incredible route up this beautiful mountain. And I wanted to go and see what it was all about. So the first step was really building the team. I reached out to a good friend of mine of 10 years that I actually grew up competing with. And that's been a really close friend of mine, Matilda Sudalen from Sweden. Then I had gone on a trip with this woman, Brett from Tahoe, and, and we had kind of hit it off in French Polynesia. So we earlier that year and the steps had started with building out the team that was going to be the best, most capable to go after this goal. And and these two women to me felt like they were. And then everything about the preparation goes down to the actual gram of food that you're bringing up on the wall. So we had started getting permitting about nine months ago for the climb because we were going to make a film about it, which we did. It'll come out in the spring of next year. And all of the logistics of where we would be setting up our base camp, where would we set up advanced base camp, what sort of material and things would we need, how much food would we need, how much time. I decided to set a month, so four weeks aside for this particular expedition and a week on kind of dispersed between the front end and the back end of getting to the location and, and building base camp and having all of the, all the people on the ground organized and set in to go. So there is a lot of planning that is not really seen on the social media side, for instance, you know, you like post from the mountain and it looks like we were just transplanted there, (laughs) but all of the transportation and and ground logistics is quite involved. So as the expedition leader of this trip, it was a really awesome experience for me to be involved in such a granular level because I love it. I'm the type of person who will lay out like my outfit the night before down to the scrunchie that I'm going to wear in my hair. So I can know that everything is the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed. So we essentially allotted enough time to work the individual pitches of this 16 pitch route, which was over 2000 feet tall in actual vertical cliff face. And then in order to climb a big wall successfully and free climb it from a ground up push, that means that you leave the ground and you do every single pitch, which is essentially a rope length and you don't fall. And if you fall on the climb itself, that's, it's totally safe to, because you have a rope. Well, it can be big falls and kind of spicy falls, but in theory you can fall. But if you do fall, you have to lower back down to 
the beginning of that pitch and do it clean, which means without falling. So that requires waiting and and watching weather windows. So I wanted our team to have enough time to also have a weather window so that when we decided to go in for the push, we could have enough days to leave the ground. And then we sleep at what's called advanced base camp, which is a point normally midpoint on the wall on past expeditions. It's involved a myriad of things. Like it could be, you're moving your portal edge up as you go. And then you're sleeping in what's like a hammock on the side of the cliff. As you make progress, this involved a ledge where we could put all of our gear and sleep on the ledge, which is about 1600 foot up feet up on the wall. So that's actually a great segue to why I actually launched a nutrition bar company, because when you're on the wall or on an expedition, for instance, for five weeks at a time, it's near impossible to get fresh ingredients and fresh food. And so something that I started doing for the last like 10 years was I would make my own nutrition bars and I would pack in freeze dried vegetables and fruit just so I could get valuable nutrients as a professional athlete, like what you feel your body with is really important. And I've taken that very seriously. I'm celiac. So I've always kind of traveled with a lot of snacks anyways, because it can be tough being gluten-free before this expedition. I had actually just launched what is called send bars and that's my nutrition bar company. And what we actually like lived off of these bars and freeze dried food for five weeks. And I was really, really happy with how they performed because food is a big part of planning. And it's like what you are eating, it needs from my perspective to be really high quality food and nutrient dense. So the, the bars have, they're packed with greens and it's, which are really incredible superfoods that help with immunity and energy and focus and your adrenal system. So that was a big part of my planning was figuring out like, okay, we're, we're seven people because we are filming and we're going to be in the mountains for five weeks. So we need oatmeal and these different additives like dates and dried fruit and seeds and protein for the morning. And then we'll eat bars and supplement in during our day, which can be really big, like 18 hour days of activity. And then freeze dried food is normally what you eat for dinner, but you're really planning out all of it, Um, which I enjoy. I'm really passionate about nutrition and knowing how to fuel your body well to sustain optimal performance over long hours. And that's kind of a side of expedition planning that doesn't always get the curtain pulled on it because it's just kind of the boring semantics maybe, but it's pretty necessary. So when you're looking at a big wall from the ground, are you quite a visual creative person? Can you almost like imagine the route as you're looking at it? Or do you need to like, would you make like a rough drawing of the rock face or would you like write like not a to-do list, but like a rock climbing list of it'll be like, oh, I'd go here to here to here. Or is it all done quite sort of mentally? So both. Um, I'm a big visualizer. Once I know the terrain of having gone up a climb once, then I can know where all the holds are, where I'm going to be like looking to place the tips of my toes and the tips of my fingers and kind of exploring the rock for the little protrusions that are sometimes so hard to see and so hard to find. But once you find them, it's kind of like you're finding these little pieces to the puzzle to put together the entire jigsaw. Once you approach a mountain and you're at the base of it. So for Pena Santa, this last expedition, you know, it's like you have this map and it's a pitch breakdown of what each individual rope length is going to roughly look at like, and then it's solving, okay, the climb looks like it could go here. This looks like the best quality rock. So we're going to try navigating from this point. And then you're basically slicing down this entirety of a wall into different segments. And those little segments are what create the wall in its entirety. So it's, um, really creative process because you have to think sometimes outside of the box and, and really keep an open mind as to where a climb 
could go and where you can see the, and often it's not necessarily the line of least resistance because if you're climbing like the hardest line up a mountain, it may be the line of most resistance. And then where actually might be possible to navigate. And it's kind of like this process of visualizing, keeping an open mind and then going for it and finding out. And if you're wrong, then you have to kind of backtrack and and look for another way. So Sasha, where is the best place for people to follow along with your climbs, your adventures, to connect with you? Where are you most active on the socials? So my social media is pretty easy. It's just at my name, Sasha DeJoyan, and it's the same across Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, Facebook. I'm pretty on top of posting what I'm up to on a day-to-day basis. So following along there, my website is just sashadejoyan.com as well. Awesome. And I really like your blog post as well. Um, you know, some of the, the topics that you've written on, really enjoyed reading them from accepting your body to the climbing emoji to why outdoor climbers may not like the Olympics and even with your mum as well and taking risks and, you know, the importance of being um, an advocate. So I'll make sure I definitely put those links in the show notes. But two final questions. One, what have you got planned for 2023? Yeah, I'll let you answer that one first. I've got a secret plan that I'm currently navigating with one of my friends to climb another wall that is in Europe. And then I also have an aspiration to try a climb in Yosemite up El Cap. That is um, something that I'm I'm pretty excited about. Awesome. So basically keep your eye on the social media to find out about the secret plan when it gets launched and goes live. And then Sasha, just I suppose words of wisdom, words of advice for other women out there who are like, you know what? I want to try climbing. I want to get outdoors. I want to step outside my comfort zone, do something new, do something different. I want to push myself a little bit more. Apart from just do it, what would be your advice and top tips? And you can take that in any direction that you'd like. Yeah. I would say that if you're interested in trying out climbing and it's whether indoor or outdoor, climbing gyms are a really great way to start because you can learn some of the climbing fundamentals. I'd recommend going with a friend. I always think that climbing with friends is just really fun and engaging. And it's a really amazing full body workout that's quite tied to socializing as well, which is a really unique component of the sport. And if you're going outside for the first time, make sure that you're going with someone that actually has some expertise, whether it's hiring a guide or a a expert from who works at the climbing gym can be a great way to figure out the next step for getting outdoors there. Um, There's definitely like a bridge that requires some safety of when you go outside for the first time, understanding how all the gear works, how you can really practice the best safety steps because climbing is a inherently dangerous sport, but when it's practiced correctly, it can be quite safe. A lot of it comes down to understanding the gear and and understanding the rock a little bit better. Then the final thing I would say that I've learned through my own process is cutting yourself some slack just in general, like being really committed to what makes you feel passionate and what makes you feel excited and following what you love to do, but also on those hard days, which are all too common for me, for instance, being kind to yourself and and keeping an open mind to not getting too down on yourself when things don't go well, because that's just life. Like life goes up and down and we all have really challenging moments, even if on the grand scale of things, the challenging moments don't seem like all that much compared to the the worldwide events that are happening. I think that that being aware of our own internal feelings and and our own body uh, and how you feel on day to day basis is really important. One hundred percent, Sasha. Thank you so much for coming on Tough Girl Podcast. It's been amazing to speak to you, and just best of luck with all your future climbs and adventures. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed it. Hey 
Hey Tribe, I really hope you enjoyed that conversation with Sasha. As always, everything that we have talked about today will be available in the show notes at toughgirlchallenges.com. So please do go and check it out. So during that conversation, Sasha mentioned that she started her own natural food bar company called Send Bars. And she very kindly sent me some of her bars to try. And I had the salted caramel ones. OMG, they were absolutely amazing, incredibly Moorish, one of the most delicious bars I've ever actually tasted. The unfortunate thing is you can't actually get them in the UK. You can only get them in the US. So if you're listening to this in the US, look out for Send Bars because, wow, just amazing and incredible ingredients as well. So, so, so delicious. So obviously there is a wide range of climbers, you know, from from bouldering all the way up to mountaineering. And we have actually spoken to, again, a wide range of climbers on the Tough Girl podcast. So just going to give a couple of shout outs, a couple of recommendations for women, um, you know, who've been on the Tough Girl podcast to share more about their climbing experiences. So we spoke with Crystal Rose Huddleston. She has a love and passion for climbing and she works as a co-director of Climbers of Colour, which is a platform for people to connect and teach black people, people of colour and marginalised communities how to climb. Adriana Brownlee came on the Tough Girl podcast. She is on a mission to summit all 14 8,000 meter peaks and become the youngest woman ever to do so. We've also spoken with Rebecca Ferry. She's a mum of five. She's an ultra runner and she's also a high altitude mountaineer who has completed the high double, which was climbing Everest and Lotsey. And then she went on to climb K2. Just incredible. Kelda Wood came on the Tough Girl podcast. She was the first female adaptive athlete to summit Aconcagua. Pranan Dangi, she's a mountain guide and climber from India who is pushing the limits on rock, ice and everything in between. Anna Taylor, she's a rock climber who recently completed a link up of all 83 classic rock climbs in the UK while cycling 1,500 miles between them. So what I would suggest you do, if you go and visit toughgirlchallenges.com, there is a resources tab and in the resources tab, there is a dedicated page to climbers. Go and have a scroll through there. Specifically, if you're looking for you know a particular mountain, a particular type of challenge um, that maybe that you are training for at the moment, then if you go there, you can scroll through, just have a quick look at it, the bio, what's written about the person that I've interviewed, and then you'll know whether that episode is going to be specific to what you are training towards at the moment. One of the other things I would say is, you know, if you do have a, a specific interest, so whether that's rowing or running or mountaineering, it's always actually good to listen to other episodes, which maybe you think, oh, is that going to float my boat? You know, I know I'm never going to row an ocean so, or I'm never going to climb the highest mountain in the world, which is totally OK, 100 percent OK. But what it is about is learning the tips and tricks, you know, hearing their advice and their stories and thinking, well, what part of that could I apply to the current challenging situation in my life? Or what could I use? What can I adapt to make it work for me? Because obviously it's very, very personalized. You know, what you're training for, everybody is different. Every life is different. Everyone's got different challenges. Everyone's got a different starting point. Everyone's got different privileges. So um, it is really very, very variable. And that's what I'm trying to do with the Tough Girl podcast is really try and increase the amount of variety that I have in the guests from the ages, their backgrounds, their shapes, their sizes, their ethnicity to, to share this whole array of women's voices. There are over 600 episodes of the Tough Girl podcast now for you, available for you to listen to. That is a massive back catalogue and I'm super, super proud of what we have created. One thing that I would love for you to do is to tell one friend about the Tough Girl podcast because that is the best way to help the podcast to grow. So whether you share them a link, whether you share it on social media, all of it helps to spread the word and share these incredible stories. If you'd like to support the mission to increase the amount of female role models in the media, then please do visit Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash Tough Girl podcast and you can sign up as a patron. You can help to pay it forward and help to encourage more women and girls to step outside their comfort zone and to take on new challenges. All that's left for me to say is wherever you are, whatever you are doing, give it your all, give it 110%, get after it, go for it, believe in yourself because I believe in you. Take care, lots of love and I'll speak to you soon. Bye.